Okay, Terry, you whenever you want it. Do you want me to no, I got share? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, you can either way. Uh, Go, ahead. Go ahead. Welcome and hi to all of you. We are very glad you're here. Each of you was among the 853 people who have registered from 10, actually 11 different countries that we know about. Most of the viewership, of course, is here in the United States where there are people from 36 states and the District of Columbia. But also in North America, there are people in Vancouver, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, as well as a handful of people in Mexico. So to those of you in North America, we say good afternoon. We say good evening to those of you in Europe, in Ireland, England, France, Sweden, Italy, Israel, Palestine, and <laughs> South Africa. We're glad you're here. And finally, to our friends in Vietnam, where it's four o'clock Saturday morning, oh my God. we're certainly glad you're here. We thank you for rising up in a very early good morning to all of you. We're hoping that you will enjoy the program that we have. Today's webinar is being organized and hosted by the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, or as we call it, BPCC. I'm a member and serve as part-time staff. My name is Kerry Province. I'll say a little about BPCC now and then more later. We were started in 2014 at the inspiration of Tom Hayden, who, as you know, was one of the defendants in the trial and would be here today, but we lost Tom in 2016. In 2014, we learned that the Pentagon received a $63 million appropriation to conduct a 10-year public relations campaign to, the, to revise the story of the Vietnam War and to put out information mainly to attract high school and college people for recruitment. Their money has organized several programs locally. They have a timeline which we have pushed back on and we have been dealing with them and going to their meetings for six years. We, just, we decided to respond to that and we've done over the last six years, conferences, seminars, film showings, meetings, dialogues, discussions, and even write a few op-ed pieces. And in fact, the New York Times carried two articles about us, one on the front page. All of that past information can be seen on our website, vietnampeace.org. You've seen the film. We think the film is very well made, masterfully crafted, and is getting generally positive reviews. But even as Sorkin understands, it is not veridical, it's not truthful, it doesn't coincide with history. And as he says, it's a biopic meant to give you a feeling of the people and the events that took place, but it is not an historical account. You'll hear from panelists and even from you between the gap between what was real and what's in the film. But we're not here only to review a film. In fact, we're here for a bigger purpose, and that is to have a discussion, a political discussion between the Vietnam anti-war movement 50 years ago and its relevance today. Why were there protesters in Chicago in 1968 when President Johnson was in office? Why a year later were leaders <clears throat> of the anti-war movement indicted federally <clears throat> by President Nixon when he was in office? Why did Aaron Sorkin, who was working and thinking about this film for 15 years, finally decide in 2017 to make it? And isn't it eerie what we see in the streets today and how it reminds us of Chicago? mass demonstrations and people in the streets, police provocation and brutality, unjust attorney generals during the work for their corrupt presidents, and even black people being murdered and gunned down. The execution murder of Breonna Taylor in her bedroom in Louisville this year reminds us of Fred Hampton's murder when he was in his bedroom in Chicago. And what are the lessons? What are the things that we can learn? Not just the consistent lies that were told by Nixon and Johnson, told by Trump today, but what are the takeaways mm -hmm. that we might be able to use for today's social justice movements and an honest discussion about maybe what were some mistakes? 
This is what we're hoping to do in the next hour and a half or more. If you allow me, before we start, I'm gonna do just a little housekeeping. This webinar entirely will be recorded and available on YouTube in a very short while. We will send an email to all of you who have registered so that you can look at it again and even tell your friends. We're gonna begin with the panelists, six presentations. And after that, I'll tell you a little more about the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, and then we'll do questions and answers. When asked, we've told people that this would be a 90 minute webinar going to 5.30 Eastern time here in the United States. But if at that time there are considerable people on the webinar and interested in questions and answers, we will continue to as long as that is the case. During the time the panelists are talking, we encourage you if you have questions and comments to put them on the Q&A. John McAuliffe, who's the convener of our group, will then aggregate those questions and pose them to the panel later. Frank Joyce, who is also a member of the committee, and I will co-moderate the panel and the webinar. Um, Brewster Rhodes, who is also here and on the committee, is going to be a timekeeper for the panelists. Our idea is this. Each panel presentation is 10 minutes. At three minutes, Brewster will tell them that. At one minute, he will tell them that. And at 10 minutes, we will ask them to stop. All of the bios for the panelists are on our website, vietnampeace.org. You go to the icon for the webinar, look on webinar information, and you'll see that. Which means Frank and I are gonna make short introductions <laughs> to the panelists, one at a time as they speak, in the interest of time. It's not because they don't have important and fascinating histories. So that's what we're planning. And we are very sorry to tell you, unfortunately, and we knew it was gonna be a possibility that Bobby Steele is not able to be here. We wish him our best and I'm sure you would too. So if that's okay, let's begin with the panel. The first panelist is Rennie Davis. For many of you who know him, and there are a lot of you who were in Chicago, and some of this is feeling like a class reunion for those of us in the anti-war movement, <laughs> Rennie was one of the defendants. We all remember back then when Spiro Agnew said, Rennie Davis is the most dangerous man in the United States, which was in fact a way of honoring him. It was due to his passion against the Vietnam War, his organizing skills, and his ability to work with a lot of people. That honor a few years later was declared by Richard, by Henry Kissinger for Dan Ellsberg, the most dangerous man in the United States, for copying the Pentagon Papers and having the courage to release them and even face a trial with 105 years in jail. We all know who's the most dangerous monster in the United States right now. Without further ado, Rennie, it's really good to see you. Welcome and please. Okay, thank you, Terry. <laughs> I feel like I'm with kind of all my favorite people who I never get to see anymore. So <laughs> I really want to thank you and, and of course, Frank and John and, and you know, everybody who helped pull this together. You know, my, uh, I, I start with the trial of the Chicago 7 movie by just going on my Facebook page and, uh, you know, according to my Facebook post, this may be the greatest movie that was ever made. You know, <laughs> it, I mean, the, the the cheering and the yay and it's here and thank you. And, you know, it, it's pretty impressive. So today you're going to hear from defendants and, you know, from the daughters and the children of defendants and people who were really there. And, and you know, as Terry's pointed out, there's we're not all lining up with how great this movie is. Uh, what I would say, I mean, you're, you're gonna hear another point of view from people who really were there. Um, we're gonna fill in the missing pieces. However, you know, I wanna say that there is a wizardry in DreamWorks in the releasing and the timing of this film. You have to admit, I mean, you've got, 
so many people, you know, a few days from an election where, I mean, there's genuine panic that this might be our last election from some people. Everybody's on the edge of their seat with fear. And to, and to have the spirit of the Chicago 8, which later became the Chicago 7, returned at this time <laughs> it is, is, is pretty precious. Is, is the perfection of timing is, is cool. There's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, Terry's right. There's so many similarities between 1968 and 2020, but there's really a, a recognition, no matter how you cut the film, that this was a group of people who actually put the government on trial for the war in Vietnam. And that is certainly the spirit that we need right now again today. So uh, I'm not gonna go into uh, trying to point out the mistakes. Uh, you know, we have a whole panel here to do that. You know, because Adam Rubin, who is the son of Jerry Rubin, isn't here, I'll maybe just stand up for Jerry a little bit. Okay. You know, I mean, Jerry's portrayed in the movie as a drug addict who basically helps demonstrators make Molotov cocktails. You know, when we were on our way to Chicago, um, we had a pit stop in Washington, D.C. because we were subpoenaed by the House on American Activities Committee. And uh, I mean, we were in a gigantic auditorium. I mean, it was just... I, I mean, you know, may, many of you remember, I mean, it, it, was, it was the last hearing ever of the House on american Activities Committee. And, you know, I, I, I remember Jerry as just, you know, the primo uh, guerrilla political activist. <laughs> I mean, he came, he came dressed in a, an American revolutionary, you know, war outfit and, and uh, yeah, of course, Tom and I, you know, we made our, our usual rational, you know, I, I think pretty good case that the House on American Activities was just the, 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 you know, violated every principle that we, we claim to stand upon, you know, but Jerry and Abby, I mean, I mean, we could never have done it without Jerry and Abby, you know, and so I, that's how I remember Jerry. I remember Abby too from there. I mean, I mean, when when uh, Abby was on the witness stand, you know, and he was asked the, I can't remember the exact words, you know, the, the famous question, have you ever now known or, you know, been associated with any member of the Communist Party? You know, Abby just leads, leads into the microphone. He's, he's completely serious, you know. He said, I refuse to answer the question on the grounds that it might tend to make me vomit. <laughs> it was so great, you know. So anyway, um, I'm going to keep my comments brief because we have so much time to hear from everybody, and you know, there's plenty, plenty of time to ask questions about any, anything you'd like to hear. But you know, uh, I mean, there's so many dynamic moments in the trial of, of the Chicago Eight. But uh, I'll just pick the two that kind of stand out for me uh, and, and look at those two moments as it's seen through the eyes of the film. You know, first, of course, is the chaining and gagging of Bobby Seale. And the movie does present the case that Bobby's trying to represent himself. And every time that, you know, he, a witness mentions his name, the judges, you know, you know, ordering him to sit down and he can't represent himself and he has a competent attorney next to him and, and you see the, the build up. What you don't see in the film, though, is the actual dynamics in the in the courtroom, which is so much more dramatic. I mean, first of all, in the courtroom, there are 30 marshals. OK, <laughs> this is a federal courtroom in Chicago. We've got 30 marshals. I mean, how do you picture these marshals? Picture, uh, picture a Cleveland linebacker. Okay, that'll give you an idea of of the of, of the marshals, you know. And what they were being ordered to do was to basically push Bobby into his chair. And so over and over again, Bobby, you know, not not. I mean, it's it's easy at the beginning, and then it gets tougher, and then it gets pretty physical. And it builds to a breaking point where the judge just flips out into hysteria. And basically, there's this morning where Bobby is the only one who's 
you know, it doesn't have bail. Uh, and so we're all waiting for Bobby to appear and Bobby comes out, you know, carried by four, you know, marshals in a chair, he's chained and gagged and, and the drama begins. And uh, now the first thing that I notice is that, you know, there's a gauze that's been pushed into his mouth and he's got a bandage wrapped around his mouth. And, and so this is intended to keep him from speaking. And so he, you know, he basically talks to the jury. I demand my constitutional rights to defend myself, you know. And I mean, you, know, you can be clearly heard by the jury. So that clearly isn't working from the judge's point of view. So the 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 ordeal begins, okay. And now what happens is that every single day it's a little bit longer. Every morning, to, and we're all waiting for him to come out, chained and gagged. And, and what, what they're doing is taking this gauze and with force stuffing it into his mouth and then more and more and then pressure bandage, more pressure bandage, you know, until he's, his whole head is wrapped, you know, and, I mean, and by the fourth day, I mean, this is, I mean, you have to understand the, the tension is unbelievable. I mean, he, they've got his arms chained so tight to his, to his chair that he's losing blood in his in his arms and you know our counselor our, our lawyer bill counselor stands up and you know complains and makes the case and 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 bobby actually at one point was able to pull loose somewhat and his arm flew up and the marshal just descended on top of bobby like he was like in some going to be in a violent you know destroy the, the whole courtroom and you know all the defendants gathered around him and you know i mean we i mean we were taking punches from the judge by the way dave Dellinger never punched a marshal okay contrary to public opinion in the film and and yet there was this was all in front of the jury and yet even on the fourth day, I mean, in the movie, it looks like this all is happening real quick in one day. No, it went on for four days. And on the fourth day, you know, I could see blood coming out of the side of Bobby's mouth. I'm sitting right next to him. I can see it. And, and still, Bobby could be heard by the jury. I demand my constitutional rights to defend myself. And here's the most important thing of all, Bobby was not just heard by the jury, Bobby was heard by every human being in the continent of Africa. Bobby was heard all through South America. Bobby was heard everywhere in Europe. Bobby was heard in Asia, Canada, all through the United States. Bobby, I mean, if, I mean a black man with his chain and gagged in the American courtroom and the whole world was basically witnessing this horrific event. And none of that is in the movie. You have no sense of that from the movie. So what can I say? That was sad, <laughs> okay. The other one was really, we had one opportunity only to actually present to the jury why we actually came to Chicago in the first place. And, and that was the moment when there were two of us who were, who we decided would testify. Uh, Abby testified, which is shown in the movie somewhat. And, and I was called to testify. I was on the witness stand for three days. And, and it was, uh, I mean, it was, I mean, what, what an opportunity. I mean, here we have Alex Sharp who won the Tony, okay, <laughs> for his acting abilities. <laughs> Randy, we're going to ask you to save some of that for the... Oh, okay, am I going too far? Sorry, all right. Thank, thank you, friend. Uh, great to see you. And you're right. We are all very glad that this film is out. It's getting well-reviewed, and it's sparking some really good discussion. So the next 10 minutes are going to be shared by daughters of David Dellinger. And I know there are many people in this webinar audience who knew David well. I was lucky to work with him for over 10 or 15 years during the war and in anti-nuclear campaigns thereafter, and a real fine person. Natasha um, was actually in the courtroom a lot of the time. She's in California. Um, she uh, actually did support work for the trial and has her own experience of the courtroom and some of that unjust. And 
you look at her bio, I liked your bio, Natasha, as you were identifying how much you liked your family and children and partner. You talked about your son-in-law, I think Marcus, and you and you identify him by son in love, which I think is a perfect, perfect Freudian thing to say. Uh, and Michelle, who was in New York City, um, who was also in the courtroom, and uh, I'm particularly interested too in Michelle. Afterwards, she went on to work with Dick Wolf and the Law and Order series on NBC. And I was wondering, is that because you were hoping to find a little more justice from the police, from the prosecutors, and from the judges than you did at the Chicago trial? We'd like to welcome both of you, please. Okay, uh, I, I think I'm gonna start. Uh, thank, you for, thank you very much for bringing us all together like this. It just fills my heart to see people and especially to get back in contact with Frank again. It's been really great. He was my big brother at the trial. Uh, I just, you know, want to say that we had a very strong family at that trial. That trial was very traumatic. To be in Chicago was very traumatic. It was a police state during the trial. I was arrested for, I don't even know if I went through the red light, but some type of a little traffic thing brought into the police station. I had, think I had to call Lenny Wineglass or something. I mean, they were following everyone who worked for the trial, who was close to the trial. It was not a fun place to be, except being with all of us who are working for and with the defendants was a really uh, very strong experience for me. Um, all of the defendants were very loving. They were all very different. They had their arguments or disagreements, but the focus was very clear and very strong. We must get out the message of what this is all about. And this was about all of the uh, young men from our country who were dying in a war that had no real purpose for us. The crazy thing, something about communism coming to America, I don't know. Uh, when all of the Black Lives Matters movement started, uh, recently, I, I just was so moved. It brought me back to that time in the 60s. Oh, well, there's a lot of differences, but there was a lot of power in the movement of all of those people getting together. So many different colors and ages and, you know, cultures coming together right now. It's just so, so important. I'm not as enthusiastic about Rennie, about the movie. I mean, he's not enthusiastic, but I really didn't like the movie. It just pissed me off. I don't like how they presented my father. My father was one of the most radical people and he was a leader and he, the defendants looked to him for wisdom and experience and calm and that's what my father had. My father is a lifelong pacifist who would never ever touch anyone. People used to needle him and say, what would you do if somebody was attacking your daughters? Then you'd hit them. He said, no, I'd get in between the attacker and my daughter. My father was a follower of Gandhi, and um, he, we were raised to know about the injustice in the world. We were raised to know about what our government was doing in the world, all over the world, not just here in this country with the economic injustice, the racial injustice. So, I mean, this trial brought together a lot of people that came from different backgrounds, but we had a really strong focus. And um, I also, I just was unhappy with how my father was presented. I mean, first of all, my, my father was never a Boy Scout leader. My brothers never went to Boy Scouts. We never lived in a suburban house. You know, we grew up in an intentional community in rural New Jersey in poverty. We ate off the land. You know, my mother made the bread and the butter. So that's where we came from. And just to have my father in the movie like that was, was upsetting. And um, I'm glad so many people know that my father was a pacifist and he would never hit anyone. But just that the trial was a really, really important time in this country. And um, that the, the government at that time was out of control. We were all followed by the FBI. I actually grew up with the FBI tapping our phone, you know, from the time I was very young. Um, and it seems like with this government that's been in, I could not comprehend what happened in 2016. I couldn't get my mind around it, that this has happened and here we are. And, and what's been going on in this country with just moving in a really fascist direction. And I think it's just so, so important, the movement that's happening today. 
you know, and that I hope that we will all continue in the work that we do. Um, I and I, when I left the trial, I went to DC and I, I was in the feminist movement. I was pretty tired of all the left male egos, you know, we needed to do something else. And um, so I tried to go at the revolutionary from the feminist aspect. We really thought we were making a revolution in those days. We really did. And um, uh, we were just totally committed to changing the world. And what we were trying to do was actually, some of us were trying to figure out what would it take to really change the way the government works. It's not that easy, you know? This government has been in place, it's a bureaucracy with power that's been in place for so many years. How do you really begin to change that? I don't even know if the answers are there yet, but we have to keep trying. And I think it does happen through the people. You know, that's how it happens. Um, Jill? Thank I, you. <laughs> I say I'm running out of time. <laughs> And I'm actually not going to take up as much time because um, I a lot has already been said about the portrayal of my father, which was quite upsetting to us. Um, and for whatever reason, Aaron Sorkin turned me into a boy, which is, you know, I, who knows why? Maybe it fit better with the Boy Scout character that he was creating for my father. Um, <laughs> But I thought maybe I would just share a couple of my vivid memories. Um, I, you know, it was a traumatic time for me. I uh, turned 13 at the trial. And, um, you know, there were good times and there were bad times. Uh, but one of my most vivid memories is when the, the whole thing was happening with Bobby Seale and it was four days and it was traumatic for everyone. And um, two things happened related to that that were, were traumatic to me. One was that I was taking care of Malik, Bobby Seal's little son, in the courtroom. And Bobby had been given balls to squeeze because the circulation was being cut off uh, in his arms. Mm -hmm. And Malik kept asking me if he could play with the balls. Could I get the balls for him to play with? And I didn't know what to say. And it broke my heart. Um, and it was just horrible. And the second thing that happened related to that was um, at one point when something happened with Bobby and my father ran to put himself in between Bobby and the guards who were hurting him. And then they grabbed him and, you know, there was a whole scuffle and they started taking him away. And I perceived that he was being hurt and everybody stood up and was screaming and making speeches. And I just fell apart and sat there crying. And one person came up to me and put their arms around me and comforted me and told me everything was gonna be okay. And that was Abby. And I will always love him for that. Um, and, you know, it's hard for me to see the film in a, in a uh, non-biased way. So of course I didn't like it. Um, that said, I'm glad it was made. I hope it does uh, bring this that event, the, the convention and the trial to a lot of people's uh, consciousness that may not have been there. And I hope that they'll do more research to find out more about it. Um, Nancy Kershaw wrote a really good piece in Counterpunch, which you can find there. Um, and there's lots more reading to do. So I hope that people will do that. And I do feel that it's very timely and important that it was made now. And I hope that it, it spurs a lot more conversation. Michelle and Tasha, thank you so much for being here and also for giving us a real intimate and honest evaluation portrayal of your father, a man I know I respected admirably and many other people did too. So we're blessed with your, with your contributions. Frank? Um, well, boy, what a treat this whole thing is. Uh, and... Uh, uh, Back at you, Tasha. So wonderful to see you. And wonderful to see Troy for so many reasons, including uh, yet another second generation uh, in, involved in this conversation. And as Troy and I were communicating a little bit over the last couple of days, I think I feel a special connection to Troy because of a special connection that I had with Tom that some people on the call know about, others don't. But Tom and I went to the same high school in Royal Oak, Michigan. And we proposed, per, that school produced a disproportionate share 
of <laughs> movement activists and displayed many early signs of rebellion. And I've said for years that uh, we started as rebels without causes and soon enough found causes. And Troy obviously is carrying that torch and it's a complete treat to introduce him and to have uh, him on this call today. Troy, go for Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I really appreciate that. I was real. I realized the other day, I grew up with a photo in our house uh, of my father sitting next to another person. And I think my father had it a book on economics on his lap and he was passed out the way that he would sleep, which was always <laughs> like that with his head thrown back and on the chalkboard behind it, it said, try harder. And I just realized that that was you next to him. <laughs> wow. And, um, so uh, yeah, you've been in my house for That's a very cool. long time. Um, I wanna thank everybody for having me. And um, you know, this is, this is a bit complicated because uh, I actually did really like the film. I found it um, very moving. And um, and I, I know how long Sorkin's been uh, struggling to get it made. And um, that's no easy feat. It's been a very long time and there's been a lot of um, uh, boulders pushed and, and, and um, organizing to get this done. Um, on the other hand, uh, I found it very disappointing. Um, um, you know, Rennie's very, very humble, but but I found that all of the defendants were very sort of minimalized and, um, and uh, uh, you know, their intelligence and their dedication was sort of, was, was, was really lost. And without getting too much into the weeds, I guess my, my macro problems um, with the film was that Sorkin criminalized the defendants. Um, at every um, march, uh, he had the he had the protesters uh, attack the police, which is uh, well, that's that is the essence of the film and the trial. That's just that is the number one sort of uh, mistake. And and so what it does is we watch a movie about defendants who are in fact, guilty of promoting a riot. Um, so I found that to be very irresponsible. Um, and I guess my, my other issue, which is an issue of the movement, was sort of the, the, um, the female experience was left out of the narrative. Uh, women were sort of um, uh, put into sort of secretarial roles or sexual objects, which was obviously a very serious problem at the time, but the truth of the matter is that the most radical actions were held by women. Um, you know, my, the, uh, my father at the time was uh, with um, Ann Wells and he, or she told me a story that she was trying to go out to get into some real action and he had to hold the door closed while she was screaming to, to get out and, and become very radical. So um, not to mention all the organizing and intellect and uh, legal scholars, that, that was sort of a missed opportunity, um, especially in light of today's movement, which is so obviously run and organized by women. So uh, that's, that's a beautiful thing and I think a mark of change. Uh, you know, my father, uh, uh, when he uh, spoke at the Vietnam peace uh, commemoration, um, his big issue, that was the, I think the 50th anniversary of the ending of the war and, uh, held by the Pentagon and the peace movement was essentially marginalized and left out. And it, my father's last, by the way, uh, today marks four years since my father died, um, mm -hmm. wow. which is uh, unfortunate because he would have been really turned on in today's climate and he would have been really excited to talk about this film. Um, his last big sort of deliberation was about um, the battle for memory and history and, and the last element of war is the victor claims the right or not the right, the ability to rewrite history. So what happens? 
radicals are marginalized and they're put on postage stamps, right? Uh, MLK is, is sort of adopted as, well, of course, this is just who we were. This is a, he's a natural part of the establishment as in even Malcolm X to a degree. When the truth of the matter is at that time, uh, he was very contentious and, and, and uh, a lightning rod, so much so that he was murdered. Um, and the truth is, is that every major change in this country was performed by radicals. And at every time uh, they went on the move, people like Rennie and, and other people on this uh, committee, they were fiercely attacked by the establishment which is the establishment's nature is to hold on to their power. And the importance of that narrative in claiming the power of radicalism is that it gets lost in the media. So that today you have hundreds of thousands of people in the street and you have people being martyred in the public circle and, and the media um, as being rude or um, unpleasant when the truth of the matter is they are really the vanguard of change and ironically 20 years from now they will be deemed sort of uh, heroes and and maybe put on a postage stamp which Colin Kaepernick most likely will end up on a postage stamp um, so I just hope that out of this talk that the message can be conveyed that all great change comes from rabble rousers. In fact, the whole principle of democracy came from uh, what was called a motley crew and they faced a trial um, by John Adams who was representing the British at the time. And um, they, they turned out to be correct. In the beginning of the trial, the nation's sentiment was pro-war. By the end of the trial, the nation's sentiment had changed. And um, this group of people on this panel broke open America. I think it was started by the Black Freedom Movement down South to redefine what it meant to be an American. So white kids in the suburbs had to really analyze who they were and what they were doing and break out of their stereotypes. For example, Judy Gumbo. She pioneered, well, she was one of the pioneers of female self-defense. There was no, there'd be no MMA and Ronda Rousey without Judy Gumbo demanding to be able to get into karate schools, right? There would be no gay uh, communities the way that they were. You know, there would be no sort of uh, evolution of, 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 of individual consciousness. These people created that. They changed the framework and identity of this country and they met massive resistance and at times assassination along the way. So uh, that history needs to really be told and respected and upheld as a guiding principle for dark days like today that you are indeed creating change. And that's, that's sort of how I feel. And we can unpack what my dad thought later. Thank you. Amen. Uh, I think Renny, you are the most humble dude in the world because you, <laughs> you and Dave and John Throins and, and Weiner just were just footnotes. It's just unbelievable. Do Sorry. Do that. Uh, you gonna introduce Judy? Yeah. Um, well, we we could take up the whole rest of the time. Uh, just me and. Judy have so much in common, so many adventures during the trial in particular, um, being in the background as it were, doing all kinds of staff work and organizing and so on. And I wanna take this chance to say that one of the things I treasure uh, about my relationship with Judy uh, is that both of us have so much appreciation for one of the so overlooked aspects of the anti-war movement and that was the role played by the Vietnamese. Part of what was special about this movement was the connection that we had and the tolerance of us that was shown by the Vietnamese and the relationships that we built that still continue some to this day. So in that spirit, uh, Judy, uh, and I know you've written some fascinating things 
uh, about the movie already. Let's hear some more. Thank you, Frank, for those delightful words. And also thank you, Rennie, for talking about the Yippies. Uh, thank you, Nancy Kirshan, who I see, whose name I see go by on the, on, on the chat. And thank you, uh, Troy, for raising the issue of women, which I actually will talk about a little bit. So I was, and I still am, consider myself a Yippie. I attended and worked at the trial, and um, I think Sorkin's movie mm. is terrific. Why? Because it focuses on all of those, all of us who protest and take down the bad guys, in our case, John Mitchell and the Nixon administration. Repressive governments go after those who are innocent. Sorkin demonstrates this in the movie. His Trial of the Chicago 7, in my opinion, is a movie in which we, the Yippies, and the anti-war movement emerge as heroes. We win. Now, I'm uh, very aware that many folks, I've, re I've been reading people's comments on the movie, a lot of people who are writing, and they, and they have their um, critiques. Well, yeah, uh, Sorkin plays fast and loose with the facts. There's no question about that. With the personalities, with those who supported acts of violence and nonviolence, you name it. But Sorkin made the movie I think he wanted. We didn't. But it's, and it's not a documentary, right? It doesn't pretend to be a documentary. I can't speak for, excuse me, for Abby, but if he had been able to see the movie, he may or may not have liked it, I don't know, but it is the major motion picture that he always lusted after. <laughs> to repeat, the Chicago A who protested against injustice remind us that we can win. <clears throat> that the movie is a gift to all resistors, in my opinion. And part of that gift is how the movie raises the issue of racism in a way that it must be raised. It touches the hearts of all of us so boldly that the audience is forced to pay attention. That the movie makes us understand that a black man chained and gagged in an American courtroom is extraordinarily relevant to our present time of ceaseless death of black people by racist cop. And as a yippie, I have to say, I'm delighted that the yippies are so prominent and our history is made so public. It's about time. <laughs> so I believe that this movie will incur, despite its flaws, will encourage protest in terms of how we reach each other. Um, and in terms of the people who are unhappy, I wanna offer you a maximum uh, 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 to my friends who are unhappy or angry or critical. I learned it as Frank point, pointed out when we, when we visited Vietnam, I learned it from a dear friend in Vietnam. His name was Do Suan Wang, and he was a diplomat who I met when I tra excuse me, traveled to the former North Vietnam as a result of my participation in the conspiracy trial. Here's what Wang says, ready? Be good to friends who are good to you, but also be friend, good to friends who are bad to you for only friends will go with you on the long road to revolution. So people may think Sorkin has been bad to us, but to me, he's a friend. And I ask you, who's more deser a, a more deserving target of our anger, a liberal Sorkin or the fascist Trump? All right, so here's what I would like to say about women. First of all, Pegasus, there's Pegasus behind me. <laughs> Pegasus, our presidential candidate was a woman or at least a female pig. I have no question about that, even though she, Pegasus, was always referred to in the media as male. Pegasus had no large tusks. Photos of Jerry's large and Abby's small cute pigs, and just FYI, there were a number of pigs in Chicago, but Jerry's and Abby's were the most prominent, of course. Um, they reveal an indeterminate gender. I recently received a, a, a greetings from Susie Barsati of the Hog Farm, who you may remember. Susie affirmed, as I've always believed, that Pegasus was the first black and white female president, presidential candidate. Indeed, she was. But as usual with women and trans, transgender folks, we are ignored. Jerry did not have a relationship with a blonde female police agent. Jerry's partner, Nancy, was a yippie and had dark hair. 
but Jerry did have a male agent named Robert Pearson as his bodyguard and Pearson testified against Jerry at the trial. You may have noticed there's no Anita Hoffman character in Sorkin's movie. In real life, the Anita I knew faced the traditional patriarchal bind of a woman married to a handsome, charismatic man. When Anita and I first met in the summer of 1968, she kept a cool but friendly distance from me. But at the trial, I began to hear the rumors. Abby, to use the vernacular of our time, took advantage of women. It was only after the rise of the women's liberation movement that Anita and I were, became close. Jerry boasted that he'd won the Academy Award of protest. My boyfriend, Stu, made the B list of unindicted co-conspirators. I was not among them. Abby told me I would have done nicely as a defendant had women been indicted. No women were. Abby's praise did not mollify me. I was crushed. In the eyes of the Justice Department and my own, I was, like many of my gender in 1969, a woman of no importance. Still, here's some of what I accomplished. Bill Kunstler appointed me the manager of the conspiracy trial office. I lasted three weeks, only to be replaced by a man. In Sorkin's movie, a tall blonde woman named Bernadine answers the phones and hands out mail, as I did. Um, she looks like Gloria Steinem. I do not. <laughs> Nor was my name Bernadine, and Bernadine is the weather woman Bernadine Dorn. As well, but I went, ah, well. But I went on to type, mimeograph, remember those? And snail mail transcripts of the trial's daily dramatics to underground media across America and as, as Rennie pointed out, across the world. Which made it clear to me that she who disseminates history can rule worlds. At the end of the trial, Nancy, uh, Anita, and Tasha, dressed as witches, burned judges' robes to denounce the verdict. That was a fabulous yippee act, and I thank you for it. Um, but speaking of burning, no bras were burned in the Chicago protests of 1968, nor were bras, oh, only three minutes, woo! Um, no, nor were bras burned one week later at the Miss America pageant. I will finish women, and then I'll talk about the Panthers in the, um, uh, in the in, later. No bras were burned. The majority of women protesters I knew, myself included, were both free agents, but also helpmates who supported men. Sorkin shows us a woman in a demo carrying an American flag. She actually carried, uh, uh, climbed a statue and carried an NLF flag to show our solidarity with South Vietnam's liberation forces. I have no knowledge whether she was subsequently brutalized, but I did observe a woman member of the British Parliament being shoved and arrested by Chicago cops. Chicago and the trial gave me, women like me, a key experience, that of self-empowerment. I learned to stand my ground, to fight back, and to resist, all of which I needed to become a free woman. Uh, I feel really bad having to postpone what I want to say about the Panthers because I've known Bobby Seale. I never knew Fred Hampton. Well, I met him once in Lincoln Park. I, I feel really bad uh, about having to postpone that. So I really hope everyone will stay around to hear what I have to say about that. Thank you. Judy, thank you. And there will be time. We will want to hear that. And let me also thank Troy. And the final panelist is Aislinn Pulley, who is a co-founder of Chicago Black Lives Matter and has been involved in arts and social justice. Is the founder and creator of Underground Philosophy, which is an urban youth magazine. And we're particularly interested in hearing from you, Aislinn, about what connections or parallels you see between then and today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually am now really interested in hearing uh, Judy, uh, what you have to say about the Panther. So I'm, I'm definitely going to be listening for that. Um, and I, I, I'll get to today's parallels, but I do want to first mention um, uh, something that I think is important and that um, isn't covered in the film, understandably, because it's about the trial, um, but specifically um, is omitted and and completely ignored in Spike Lee's film about black soldiers in the Vietnam War. 
um, and it was the role of soldiers um, in the in the Vietnam War resistance movement, um, of which my father was one, Andrew Pulley, who was a part of the Fort Jackson Eight, who were soldiers who organized on base against the Vietnam War and were then incarcerated because of it. Um, and the role of soldiers who organized actively against the Vietnam War is a story that also needs to be told. <clears throat> um, and, and so I just want to lift that up um, and recognize um, the, that the anti-war movement was so powerful, not only for the individuals who are depicted within the film, um, but also for what was happening within the military itself. Soldiers actually refusing to take up arms and carry out the orders um, of the uh, imperialist rulers that um, were demanding that of them and, and were an integral part to fighting back. Um, uh, so I just, I wanna lift that up specifically because of the Spike Lee film that is a piece of propaganda um, that is destructive, I think. Um, um, I, you know, I think, you know, some of what was in the film, the things that I most ap appreciated um, and uh, most resonated with me were, were the depictions of the brutality by CPD. And, um, and it's something that, um, you know, I experienced and, and thousands of us in Chicago have experienced just over the course of this past summer. Um, we experienced the beatings, we experienced the tear gas, which was, be which was used on us for the first time um, since the NATO protests, um, uh, we, we experienced um, people, people's heads uh, being bashed in, uh, people's um, limbs being broken, and the beatings were so severe that we demanded a, um, a two-day hearing, public hearing, before a federal judge, Judge Dow, who is the judge that is overseeing the consent decree, so that we could report um, and every single person who testimony, who, who, who participated in that public hearing over the course of two days um, this summer reported on the beatings that they themselves experienced. Um, so what is most striking is the similarity in, in the brutality and that that has not changed. Um, and in fact, um, I think one of the things that can be argued is that what we've seen um, is an increase in the militarization. Uh, we know that concretely that has meant that there have been um, billions of dollars of, of military grade weaponry um, that have been uh, issued to police departments throughout the country. Um, the, the, the routinization, the normalization of the militarization of the of police forces um, has increased. Um, and so what we're facing now uh, and what we faced this summer and what we will continue to face um, um, is police departments acting like domestic armies against its own citizenry and against its own populace. Um, and so that level of brutality um, is really, really important for uh, people in the movement now to be able to witness that it's not new and that this has happened before. And there's a logic behind it. It is the way that the state uses um, its military force, its might to suppress rebellion, to suppress movement. Um, and so we need to develop as organizers now on the ground, need to develop tactics to survive that and tactics that don't result in um, uh, more of our people being entered into uh, the system of mass incarceration. Um, one of the things that you know, I, I'm left with after viewing the film is, is the, the, the fact that there are so many people who are still incarcerated right now for the organizing work um, that, that the film depicts. And so many people who have died in prison. Um, uh, and, and we need to keep remembering that and demanding that they be freed. Um, that's still the work of, of this movement. And that's part of our legacy as, you know, as um, and giving honor to the blood, sweat and tears of, of the fighters that have come before us. Um, so, so that is incredibly important and something to continually remember that this is not a, this is not just of yesterday, right? This is of right now. And that that trajectory, that link 
um, is alive and well. And it's the heartbeat that links us to the fighters um, that are represented within the film. Um, Alfred Woodfox, for example, was part of the um, Angola 7, uh, was just released two years ago uh, and um, spent 45 years incarcerated. And, 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 and of those years, over 40 of them were in solitary confinement. And so the torture that organizers have experienced needs to also be reckoned with, right? As we continue this work forward and know that this is the, the power and the might of the state that, that we experience. I think another important um, thing that resonated with me um, but while watching the film is, is the understanding of how the police forces and the might of the state um, enact their violence disparately and how it's racialized in a very unique way, right? So we saw the assassination of Chairman Fred Hampton occur. We saw the bounding and gagging of Bobby Seale. Um, and that distinct racialization of the way that the force of the state um, operates continues today, which is why Black Lives Matter exists um, as a movement. Um, and it's because of that disproportionate amount of state violence that is enacted on, on Black bodies. Um, um, and that, that, is, that distinction is important. Um, and so, um, it, 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 and it shows up in tactics. And, and I believe, you know, obviously I wasn't there um, in the 60s, but I believe, you know, that tension was existed then, right? I, 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 I remember, um, hearing about conversations with Chairman Fred um, about tactics that other that white organizers were using and the difference of the impact that that was going to have on the black community and so that tension still exists now we very much have those arguments and have those conversations now um, particularly um, this summer where over 2,000 people uh, were arrested based on the uprising in Chicago and were brutalized and concerns, very real concerns about the difference in the consequences that white organizers face versus black organizers. Um, and I also just want to quickly mention that um, CPD continues to be one of the most brutal police forces in the country. Um, CPD, I'm, I'm also, I, you know, I'm the co-founder of BLM Chicago. I'm also one of the co-directors of the Chicago Torture Justice Center. And the Chicago Torture Justice Center um, came about out of the reparations ordinance for survivors of police torture. Um, John Burge, who is a po former police commander um, in Chicago, tortured at a minimum count, because this is the count that the city verified which means that you know that it's conservative, a minimum count of over 120 primarily Black people. And that torture was taken from the training that he received in Vietnam. He used um, electrical, he used a, a, a telephone box to electrocute people and, and used it on people's genitals, um, among a whole host of other supposedly uh, called advanced interrogation techniques. Um, and through the course of decades, because he, he remained commander for decades, um, trained a whole host of other police officers to carry out this torture. Um, and uh, after decades of fighting, including the firing of John Burge, including John Burge being tried and convicted on perjury and obstruct, obstruction of justice, not on torture because the statute of limitations had expired, um, he was charged. And, uh, and did a two and a half year bid in federal court and was released on Valentine's Day. Um, survivors then felt like that was not enough. And so we, we created a reparations ordinance. Um, and that reparations ordinance uh, provided five uh, very transformative elements. Um, and so what it, what it, part of what it did was create the center that I work at, which is the first center in the country dedicated to domestic torture. Um, and I say that it only in order to crystallize the, 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 the tr the, that the nature of policing in Chicago remains incredibly brutal, incredibly torturous, and that the problem of policing is why we are in the movement that we're in now. Um, on, on the west side of Chicago, we have a black site that was identified by the Guardian newspaper after suing Chicago for many years. 
where over 7,000 people have been disappeared. And this is blocks away from where Chairman Fred Hampton and Deputy Mark Clark were assassinated. This is Chicago today. So we're gonna ask- So I'll, I'll wrap up. Thank I'm you, Terry. Listen, thank you. Sure. Um, listen, to you and to all the panelists, I really wanna thank you for your personal stories and, and contributions here. You provided us a lot in setting the stage for the question and answers. And I wanna thank you all too for being cooperative with the time limits. I'm now gonna call on Frank Joyce, who was one of the members of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee and a well-known social justice activist. And to let you know that he's co-written a book called The People Make the Peace, Lessons for the Vietnam Anti-War Movement. And we're asking Frank to sort of do a, a wrap up here and set the stage a little further for the Q&A that will follow soon. Frank? You're on mute, Frank. <laughs> There you go. There we go. Um, thanks, Terry, and thanks to this terrific uh, panel and Aislinn who has brought the, a, a whole additional perspective into this. Uh, I'll say right up front, I'm not a fan of the movie, but this, the movie and this webinar makes me even more a fan of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee and why we exist. And I'm really glad to be part of this webinar and proud of how our little tiny group keeps punching above our weight. And because of who we are, I start with the perspective that for more than 50 years, from the Pentagon to Hollywood with Ken Burns in between, there has been a concerted effort to trivialize and diminish the anti-war movement. And for good reason, I get that. Mm -hmm. Ours was a movement that for the first and only time in US history inspired massive numbers to confront the machinery of violent and endless territorial conquest. In my view, this movie is a part of the campaign to discredit what we accomplished. As my friend Stuart Severn said to me in a conversation yesterday, there's a difference between poetic license and disinformation. And in the limited time I have, I want to give three examples of how I think that plays out in the film. The point that David Dellinger did not hit a marshal has already been eloquently made. I would add this context. As Dr. King and more recently Reverend James Lawson taught us, we live in a nation that is one of the greatest purveyors of violence in the history of humankind. So portraying one of the leading pacifists of the 20th century as an impulsive hypocrite is well beyond poetic license. Something definitely more important to understand is afoot in that portrayal. By the way, as some people on the call know, I feel like I have some standing to speak on this subject because during the entire trial, there was only one person to my knowledge who did physically assault any marshal in the courtroom. That person was me, and that's a story for another time. <laughs> but equally, if not more insidious in the film is the treatment of Bobby Seale and Fred Hampton. Given the time constraints, I just wanna make one point about this. Fred Hampton was decidedly not assassinated for annoying the government by whispering legal advice to Bobby Seale in the courtroom. In fact, I'm not sure that ever even happened. Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were killed because they were well on their way to building in Chicago and beyond a complex political and cultural movement that sought to bring together black, Latino, and both poor and not poor whites to deeply challenge white male property owning power. The very thing that the establishment fears most of all. Which brings me to my third point, which is one about omissions. What's missing from the movie is both the war itself and the amazing mass movement that we organized to oppose it. What's missing is the fact that we acted with and on behalf of not just US soldiers, citizens and taxpayers. What's missing is the functional solidarity of both the political and the cultural revolutionaries with the Vietnamese and other anti-colonial movements underway in the world at that time. What's missing was our revulsion at Agent Orange, Napalm, and the corporations that made them. 
What's missing is our disgust with carpet bombing and me lie. Our slogan was not just bring the troops home. It was also, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? And how many kids have been separated from their parents by the immigration process? How many kids are being kept from their parents by the United States military in the world today? No one will watching this movie will learn any of that. And as somebody with a little bit of experience in script writing and with the demonstrations leading up to the trial and the trial, there were ways to incorporate that into this movie. Because not learning part that part is itself a component of the culture of violence that protect, protects the enduring power of the fourth branch of the United States government. That's the Pentagon. And the threat to that culture is what the big, messy anti-war movement represented then and hopefully will come to represent again during the Biden presidency. Thank you very, very much, Frank. That's an excellent way to conclude this part of the program. And I think you've all been given quite a bit of information. There's a very robust chat and Q&A going on and a lot of appreciation for the program and we appreciate you. And you can still ask questions by doing this through the chat room or the Q&A, excuse me, and we'll start the question and answer discussion in just a few minutes. But first, I want to say a little bit about the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. As Frank said, we're a group of 14 women and men who have been working for six years to try and remember the power of protest and the power of the anti-war movement. And we continue to do that in three different ways, which we'd like to inform you. One is pushing back on the Pentagon. As we've told you, the Pentagon calls me lie an accident, when in fact there were 30 me lies. The Pentagon story about the war blames it on the media and the anti-war movement for the defeat in Southeast Asia. And the Pentagon is deliberately trying to bring its message to high school and college students through community programs, even during football games, in order to, you know, revise the the, the Vietnam War rebranded, if you will, in order to encourage a recruitment, enlistment. Uh, they have an advisory committee that's chaired by Tom Ridge, the former governor of Pennsylvania and the first Homeland Security Secretary. Uh, it is Rocky Blyer from the Pittsburgh Steelers, Morton Dean from CBS News, and Jan Scruggs from the Vietnam Memorial. I've been going, because the meetings are here at the Pentagon and in Fort Meade, I've been going to those meetings for six years now, trying to indicate other things so that they get a sense of what we do. And we keep up with them and follow their website and try to get them to change their educational materials as well as their timing. The second way in which we are involved happens to be around two other films both made by people within the anti-war movement, and you will, uh, you will want to see these. And they're made by people from, they're involved people from our committee as well. The first is called The Boys Who Said No, which is about the draft resistance movement. And uh, on that is uh, Steve Ladd, who was their public relations director. And the producer today is Bill Prince, and his co-partner was also a producer, Christopher Jones. They've come to several of our meetings. They've shown us clips of it. We've helped them discuss it and make some changes. And we're very glad that it is about to come out. Well, actually it is out. It'll be available soon to all of you. It won the audience award film at a recent California film festival. It's directed by Judith Ehrlich, who is a Academy Award director. And the second one also involves Steve Ladd, who is the producer and uh, Robert Leverin, who is the executive producer, and it is called The Movement and the Mad Men. And you can understand this is about Nixon for sure. This movie is still in production, is about to come out soon. It's directed by an Emmy uh, director, uh, Stephen Talbot, and we will let you know about its availability as soon as it is available. And you can get that also from our, our website. But here's what we have planned for the next six to eight months. We have at least four webinars planned right now, and we might even do more. 
We have one each in March, April, May, and June of 2021. The first one is on the People's Peace Treaty and the role of people-to-people -people diplomacy between nations that our governments put in conflict. And one of our members, Doug Hostetter, was involved in the People's Peace Treaty mm -hmm. with students from the United States who met and discussed with students from North Vietnam and students from South Vietnam the principles for a peace agreement, which several years later became the basis for the January 27th, 1973 peace accord. That will be with people from Vietnam sometime in March. In April, on April 4th or around April 4th, when Martin Luther King in 1967 came out against the war with his Beyond Silence speech at Riverside Drive, and on the very day, April 4, 1968, he was murdered in Memphis, Tennessee. We have a project that we're gonna tell you about at the end of the program. And we're doing a webinar on the religious opposition to the war in Vietnam with Christian and a Jewish representative, along with people from the Poor People's Campaign. So you wanna look forward to what churches did against the war and what churches are doing in today's social justice movements. May 2021 is the 50th anniversary of May Day. Manny Davis was very much involved in May Day. 14,000 people were arrested, speaking of mass civil disobedience and nonviolence. And we will do a webinar around the 50th anniversary of May Day. What was that about? What did we learn? How was that applicable? And finally, in June, on the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers, we already have Dan Ellsberg, Noam Chomsky, Representative Patricia Schroeder and Gar Alperwitz. Gar Alperwitz is the least known of those who came out recently sharing. He was the one who got the Pentagon papers copied and delivered to 14 different newspapers. So you want to look at that. And I will tell you about the Martha Luther King project before the program is over uh, 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 by 5.30. I'll do that at the end because you can easily be involved in that. It's about readings of his speech. Now, we do most of these things on our own, but we do need financial help. Um, I get $25 an hour, uh, so I make my contribution by only asking for that much. Uh, we have to pay sometimes for a media expert for publicity. We also need professional help for web design and art design that we do for our promotion things. After this is over, we have about $3,000, and by June of next year, we need $30,000. So I would like you to show us your appreciation or play fill in the blank with us. You can donate online or by sending, writing a check and sending a check. All of that is available on our website. There's a donate button right there when you open the page. Donations are tax deductible. And believe you me, the, 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 the money is well spent. And I, I, I appreciate what Frank is saying about how we try to maybe maximize our cooperation together and, and make things effective. So we would love you to join in those webinars that are about to come. And uh, if you can support as much as you can, $25 buys another hour of my time, uh, we'll, be, we'll be really great. Okay, so let's move to the Q&A. Uh, John has been collecting um, questions. I think what I'll do is start with one and ask John to then ask one and then Frank to ask one and then we'll see where we go from there if it's okay. And people can uh, ask their questions to one or all of the panelists. If okay with you, and we're doing okay with the time, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you, Renny, one question that sort of picks up on today and looks back in, in the 60s. And that has to do with how integrated the anti-war movement was. You know, Martin Luther King <clears throat> brought in a lot of opposition to the war with his speech in 67, but he's also pushed back by quite a few people who felt that he was diluting the civil rights issue by combining them. I'm curious to know how multiracial do you think the anti-war movement was, or was it more separate? We're all grateful to the civil rights movement where we borrowed a lot of tactics and many people like you and others were active in the civil rights movement. But once the anti-war movement happened, there was sometimes people would say, you know, when we'd come to Washington, we would do things and then leave and, you know, the city would be a mess and we didn't clean it up and African-Americans were disappointed. How integrated, how multiracial do you think the, the anti-war movement was 50 years ago? 
pretty marginal. But the thing is, is that we did discover something that we're slowly getting today, which is <clears throat> um, if you look at our whole history from 1960 to 1965, we were basically individual organizations. And in 1965, we began to realize, you know what, we, we actually had got to find what we can agree on and, and unite in a coalition. It took two years to put that together. But in, uh, I mean, to give you an idea of the anti-war movement in 1965, the first anti-war demonstration was from one organization, Students for Democratic Society, maybe 25,000 people. We were thrilled. We thought that was a gigantic number. Two years later, the National Mobilization Committee that represented 150 national organizations all agreeing on two issues and the war in Vietnam and end racial discrimination in America. We could agree on that, uh, basically produce this first demonstration with 150,000 people at the Pentagon. And uh, when I became the coordinator of that coalition on our way to Chicago, I was fully confident that we would bring 500,000 people to Chicago. After Chicago, we brought 500,000 people to Washington, D.C., and another 250,000 people in San Francisco on the same day. Okay, so, so I'm saying coalition, while difficult, okay, is, is, an, is an issue before us. The one other thing I want to say that is uh, not to undermine anything that's been said that's been so inspiring today, but, you know, if you think about it, sometimes events change everything. In 1964, there was no anti-war movement. I mean, no one knew where Vietnam was. I mean, it was. So then when U.S. troops landed in Vietnam in 65, I mean, th there was no stirring on American campus against the war, but, but there were people who were able to look up and see the horizon and see what was coming over the horizon. And it was clear that there were, you know, everything was changing because of events, okay? And the anti-war movement came about because of an event, not because of conferences like this or our brilliant ideas of what to do. So I just want to say that again with love in my heart in saying this, events are coming that you don't need to be a psychic to see what they are either. Common sense can tell you, everybody can see it's warming up, but you don't, we may not fully grasp what that means, you know. I mean, warming up means droughts and droughts means uh, there's p places all over the world where farmers have basically farmed successfully for a thousand years and, and suddenly they have to choose to die or to leave. We're going to face hundreds of millions of people migrating across international borders and every nation state's going to be challenged. And then aquifer depletion is going to grow by leaps and bounds. And so what's in front of us is food distribution chains are going to be snapping. So a really yeah, I, listen, I, only in the interest of time, I know it's all important, but uh, in order to get a lot of questions in, because there are a lot of questions, I'm going to ask John to ask the next one, and then Frank, so thanks for your, your starting. And, and people, try and keep them a little short so that we can get a lot of questions. John? Okay, um, let me just quickly do a little bit of housekeeping, because some questions have come up that have to do with that. Um, we will make the chat list available. Um, and I hope also can make the Q&A available to people. Uh, some folks use the Q&A for more substantive interjections than the chat. Um, but those things will all get to be available through the information, mm -hmm. the blog page that uh, you can see the bios. Um, the, uh, they're included already on there are several films that people have asked about um, and articles that people have asked about. So uh, you can go to that uh, and, and you'll be able to update yourself. Now, I'm gonna start out with some very specific questions about 
the trial. Um, and I'm not sure whether Frank or Rennie or if Troy's been gone or Judy, whoever feels like they're, they know the answer to these specific questions that I think are asked because people really are hungering to understand. Um, one of the things that is listed on their resource list is John Wiener's book. Uh, and that's probably the best source to go deeper into the, uh, all of what was going on. Um, available in paperback on your favorite book distributor. Um, so very concrete questions from Aaron. Uh, was there really jury tampering similar to that depicted in the film? What does everyone think of prosecutor Richard Schultz and how he was depicted in the film? How was the decision made to have Rennie and Abby testify? What went into that decision? Uh, there was a question also of somebody who said his father was a teenager living in Chicago who tried to get into the trial and couldn't get close to it, but commented to him that no one really knew what was going on. What was the press coverage like at that point? Was the segment on Ramsey Clark accurate? When did the public find out about his Justice Department report? How accurate was the portrayal of Ramsey Clark? Did the Chicago Eight spend time in jail while waiting for appeal? And they were depicted coming in in jail uh, uh, costumes or uniforms. Um, and there was also a question to talk about the witnesses that the defense called. Did Var? I'm going to mispronounce it. Vardir Happen was the former attorney general called and was his evidence really what was that his administration concluded that the police started the riots on what grounds was that evidence ruled inadmissible. So I ask you to those, stop. go ahead and not, that's it, Terry. Those are okay. all of the, the factual questions. Um, if people want to pick them up and then I'll, if you need a question repeated, tell me that. So Rennie or Judy, do either of you want to begin? Um, I'll begin. Uh, I'm looking now at Tom's uh, idea. It's very cool. Um, all right. So let me say about Schultz. Every, he was portrayed in the movie as a much nicer guy than everyone experienced him. And he was also, he didn't look at all like the, like, like, like the picture, like, like the person in the movie, but he also in the movie seemed to have a conscience. We did not experience him as having a conscience. And also, uh, <laughs> Ferran was the one who took the lead in the, uh, it, it, it wasn't Schultz. Schultz was kind of the, 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 the backup. So uh, why um, uh, Sorkin chose to make Schultz and make him a more complex character. But that, again, you know, in my point of view, that is the movie maker's privilege. Um, now, in terms of the press, uh, I, when I would enter the courtroom, I would be sort of move, moved or, or shown to the right side of the of the courtroom uh, in the row behind the press, which is where the uh, friends and uh, relatives of the defendants sat. And all the hippies who were lining up, and you mentioned someone was lining up and couldn't get in. Well, that, that was because there were huge lines all the way uh, back, uh, in, in, especially when Abby and, uh, especially when Abby spoke. I don't know. I don't remember being there for Rennie, but especially when Abby spoke, there were huge lines all the way back. And um, on, so that was uh, on your screen, that would be the left side. But as you entered, that would be the right side. On the, on, on, on the other side were all these uh, people uh, dressed, the men were dressed in bespoke suits and the women wore high heels. I mean, they might, it was like uh, as if a hippie bride was marrying a Republican <laughs> groom. That <laughs> courtroom looked like me. Um, and the press, I mean, I, I knew something about the press coverage because it, tons of press, the office was always filled with press people. That second row back, the first row back was, was always filled with press people. Remember, they could not take pictures 
So they drew pictures and there were, there were some very iconic pictures of Bobby Seal uh, chained and gagged, but they're, but they're actual hand drawings. Uh, and the, so the press was very, it was drama. It was drama and the press, and, and every day with the trial transcripts that I got, I would either, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd hand them out to the press and, and then mail them and they used the drama of the trial to um, get the trial very well known. I, I mean, you know, what in Chicago in 68, we said the whole world was watching in, uh, at the trial in 69, the whole world watched because of the press, uh, sending things out. And it, the press was not nearly as divided ideologically uh, as it is today. Um, and um, I just wanted to show, Frank mentioned a book that he, I'm going to just slip this in. Here it, here it is, Frank, the people make Thank the Thank you, piece. Judy. <laughs> You're very welcome, dear. Thank Frank, you. You want, to, you want to comment on any other questions that, uh, uh, that John just asked? Yeah, the Ramsey Clark question came up in a variety of ways. So if or Rennie? Yeah, so Ramsey Clark's a long story. I'll try to be brief here, but I mean, basically, we I moved heaven and earth to try to find out from the Justice Department its position on permits. You know, I couldn't believe that the national government wanted to have a police riot in Chicago at their convention. And so uh, what happened was that we finally did make contact with Ramsey Clark. And he sent out his right-hand person, uh, it was a black executive named Roy Wilkins, who's, you know, and we danced around each other, trying to get to know each other for a while. And quite honestly, I came to like him and he very much came to like me. And, you know, I trusted that he really sincerely understood we were a coalition committed to nonviolence and we wanted permits, and we were planning to bring 500,000 people, and permits was the solution. So he went in to meet with the mayor, and he came back to me, and, you know, basically the mayor just went full red throats, you know, I mean, just exploded with the mention of my name, and basically he went on to a 20-minute tirade that convinced Roy Rokens that permits were not going to be granted. <laughs> so we very much wanted Roy Wilkins. And the movie is somewhat, I mean, he did come on the stand. You know, he, he was a real witness and it was good and it was po a positive thing for, for, the, for, the, for the trial. So. Great. Hey, Frank, you want to ask Can I make one quick comment on that? Yeah. I mean, yes, there was huge press coverage and several journalists kind of made their reputation uh, on their coverage of the trial. Um, and with regard to Ramsey Clark, consistent with what I said earlier, the suggestion that the trial was caused by some peak uh, that John Mitchell had over how Ramsey Clark submitted his resignation is another instance to me of sort of trivializing the facts and of what was the conflict between the government uh, and all of the people who were involved in the movement uh, and, and who came to be involved in the demonstrations which produced the trial. Great. Frank, do you want to ask a question and then we'll go back to John? Yeah, I, I had a question for Troy because I know Troy has paid a lot of attention and has a lot of uh, source material on sort of the discussions, conversations, whatever they were, between Tom and Sorkin, and it's my understanding that Tom was the only one of the people, the defendants or anybody else close to the trial that Sorkin spoke to. And Troy, I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little about that. Yeah, as to why uh, Sorkin didn't contact uh, the other living defendants and family members, I don't know. Um, you know, he didn't know anything about the trial. He hadn't heard about the trial until that animated film had come out, which I believe Spielberg either paid for or bought called the Chicago 10, which included Lenny Weinglass and Bill Kunstler. But I, I am in possession of all of the correspondence between my father and um, Aaron Sorkin. Um, and, uh, you know, my father was opinionated. And uh, he had a, I guess you could critique Tom by saying he thought he was always right. 
and maybe uh, a lot of time he was, and I'm sure sometimes that uh, prevented him from seeing other opportunities. Um, but I think his main issue was sort of the fabrication of um, uh, sort of the, the portrayal of Tom suggesting that Abby didn't want to end the war and Abby suggesting that Tom just wanted to win elections. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just not true, you know? Um, right. So to quote my father, you know, or not to quote, what he wrote was, Abby definitely wanted to end the war and fight the cultural revolution. It would have been horribly unfair, a fabrication to have me say, the last thing you wanna do is end the war. I never would have, question whether Abby was anti-war. That's Aaron's notion from the beginning, that I wanted to end the war and Abby wanted to give the finger to the establishment. Those are Aaron's words. Again, there is a simpler truth. I was serious, political, legal, and he was theatrical and media oriented. I thought it was funny, perhaps, but totally off message to levit levitate the Pentagon, though it was anti-war. I felt that some of us, especially Rennie, Dave, and Lenny, Wineglass, were doing the heavy lifting in the anti-war movement and the trial defense, and that the Youth International Party was a non-existent fantasy. I had a problem with Abby and Jerry being loaded all of the time. You know, history and this kind of theater don't mix. Abby and Jerry and the Yippies were trying to build a revolutionary organization with themselves as rock stars. This is justified by McLuhan's notion that you reached people with images over media. I believe this was elitist bullshit. And when the trial was over, Abby, Jerry, the Yippies, and much of the counterculture just faded away or burned out. But the anti-war, anti-Vietnam movement prevailed by grinding it out through 1975. Now, obviously, I don't think that this is <laughs> represents exactly how he felt because obviously you know his uh hero was c wright mills and c wright mills believed in um uh, cultural revolution in line with economic revolution and that both of them are, are sort of inseparable um and that in fact uh you know uh political change and cultural change are uh, uh dependent on each other and that social movements in and of themselves are anti-establishment. So, right, thanks. Yeah, I, okay. I, I'm, only there you go. I'm only trying to share the, 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 the audience and you uh, sort of as much as possible. Um, Got it. Thank you. John, do you want to ask another question? And maybe only just want to make it kind of more simple or not so many. <laughs> You're on mute, John. You're still on mute. There you are. You're still on mute. Go on mute. Well, well, listen, John. I'm okay. Gonna... No, there I'm on. Okay. Okay. Um, what I what I wanted to uh, quickly say is there are a lot of people who are trying to establish contact with each other. The way to do that is to choose at the bottom of the chat column a particular person's name, send them a private message, put your email address in that message, and hopefully it'll go from there. I mean, one of the things uh, we now, we've been higher, but we're showing now 532 people still active in, in this. So. Uh, the, what we're discovering on this is a, a big opportunity to reconnect. Um, the qu one question that, that uh, came up um, from, from several people is to go a little bit more into the relationship of the trial to Fred Hampton and, to, and Bobby and the Panthers and what sort of larger lessons might be drawn from that that have to do with ongoing relationships between uh, the 
anti-war community and people who are more directly involved in struggles like Black Lives Matter. John, can I interject one thing really quickly about this? This is another important factual thing. In the film, Sorkin has uh, Fred Hampton being shot in the shoulder, which says that was the justification that he actually couldn't defend himself. But that suggests that Fred Hampton had an aggressive pose. Right. The truth of the matter is Fred Hampton was shot in the head twice while he was asleep. That's all I have to say. John, you I want to say something about the Panthers? John, I, I, Terry, I would like to take this opportunity to say what, yeah. what I was going to say about the Panthers. Yeah, I was just asking you to do that, yes. Oh, good. <laughs> we think alike. All right. So um, I first met Bobby uh, in 1968 when he was chairman of the Black Panther Party. Uh, he, I met him because my boyfriend then husband and now late husband, Stu, had two best friends. One was Jerry and the other was Eldridge Cleaver, minister of information for the Black Panther Party. So I ended up going to the Panther office, attending study groups, and really getting, and this was early 1968, really getting imbued with Black Panther Party uh, way of thinking. And the, and when, and the Black Panther, at the time, SNCC and many of the African-American organizations had kicked a white people out. The Panthers did not. In fact, the Panthers had a phrase for them, for us, which was white mother country radicals. And we white people were the white mother country radicals because America, white America was the mother country and black America was the colony. And it's a phrase that Eldridge Cleaver came up with. And so uh, at the trial, I remember the portraits of slave owners on the wall that had been referred to just glaring, glowering down uh, uh, at Bobby uh, and the, everyone. And before Bobby's case was severed, and I just wanna make this very clear, that was the act that when Bobby's case was severed, that was the act that turned the Chicago eight into the Chicago seven. And uh, uh, from back and forth, you know, it's hard to know what the eight, seven, it's hard to know how to put it out now, but really we knew them always as the Chicago eight. And when, so Bobby pointed to those paintings up on the wall and he, this is what he said. He said, what can happen to me more than what Benjamin Franklin and George Washington did to black people in slavery? What can happen to me more than that? And my ask, what, what indeed, the, 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 with by now Bobby being chained and gagged is legend, but as we know, racism continues. Now, as for Fred, I met him once when he came to uh, Lincoln Park to be Bobby's bodyguard in 19, at, 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 during the convention. Um, and I don't believe he ever advised Bobby in the courtroom. But what matters, at least to me, is that he was, he is remembered. He's an identifiable personality in the film and his death by racist cops who murdered him in his bedroom is no different from, I think it was Terry who said, how Brianna Taylor died. That continues. And I'll never forget the day that Hampton was shot. It was Stu's 30th birthday, December 4th, 1969. And Jerry barged into Stu's in my bedroom, bellowing that we must get up immediately. Fred Hampton's dead, he yelled. Mark Clark, two Chicago cops shot and killed them. And Stu and I went to Hampton's memorial. It was so packed with angry, sad, upset people that we, we waited outside in the cold. We were lost in this gigantic crowd. And, but I, and, and I remember hearing Bobby Rush over the megaphone and what Bobby Rush, who was at the time the Minister of Defense of the Chicago chapter of the party, and he later became a congressman from Illinois, Bob, Bobby Rush said, black people will be free or we will level the earth in our attempts to be free. We want liberty or death. There is no other way out. And that is what Black Lives Matter teaches us today. Liberty or death, there is no other way out. Thank you very much. Frank, why don't you ask a question and then we'll go back to John. Um, well, uh, I'd love to hear again uh, from uh, Aisley. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Just, okay, so now you've had some immersion something experience here uh, and in this, but you do represent uh, a, a, such an important part of the movement uh, of the moment. So I, I, ju I just would welcome brief comments and thoughts that you may have. Um, yeah, well, that brings tears to my eyes. Um, 
just thinking about uh, the assassination um, and and uh, what I what I would like to lift up is that CPD definitely uh, was a part of the assassination, but it was also a conspiracy between CPD, the FBI, and the state's attorney's office. Um, and that is important to remember, um, as particularly as a Chicagoan, um, because it crystallizes how entrenched multiple levels of government conspire um, in many ways. Uh, to perpetuate the continued um, oppression and subjugation of, of people, and specifically um, in covering up uh, uh, the brutality that is waged um, uh, by police um, and, and, and other entities. Um, and so uh, his son, Chairman Fred Jr., um, is someone that I hold dear in my heart. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the impact of the assassination um, is huge in Chicago. Um, and it, and it, it's, it's so instructive of, of so many things, um, including uh, the resistance and, um, and, and as well as uh, the resilience um, of organizers to continue the work. So at, even after the assassination, um, it took years, but people organized and, and sued the, the government and won. Um, and, and that's important to remember. Um, but that level of brutality was, was waged all throughout the country uh, in decimating uh, chapters of, of the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. um, and that brutality was uh, is something that um, is replicated today in terms of the uh, the aggression and the labeling of today's organizers as Black identity extremists. Thanks. John? Okay. Um, I'd actually like to formulate a question to you and Frank, um, because we all were involved in the interpretation and struggle with the Burns and Novak film series or a series that was on public television. And I'm just wondering how you feel now about the impact of the Chicago 7 film and in contrast with the Burns Novick series and maybe in contrast with the boys who say no. Well, I think that's a great question, John, and thanks. So that people know, we actually met with Lynn Novick uh, who was the co-director of the PBS 10-part program on the Vietnam War. We were concerned about what we had heard and seen and parts of what they showed us about the anti-war movement. And we were, I, I, I particularly, I mean, I, I speak for myself, uh, dissatisfied at the, at, the, at, the, at the least for, you know, suggesting that there were a lot of anti-war protesters like spitting on returning GIs when the relationship between GIs against the war was something very important to us. Um, it, it, it narrowed the, uh, the, the, the image of the anti-war movement. Uh, Burns, I think, had an approach that both sides had, the, had right stories and we disagreed with that um, in terms of you know, what the war was about. It did do some good historical stuff, but it didn't explain well why the war was fought and what, what, what happened. And we also had some criticism of uh, the Five Bloods and sort of um, how that portrayed <coughs> um, the anti-war movement. I, I, I think Frank has a good point about how the larger anti-war movement is not there in the Sorkin, Charles Chicago 7 film. Um, but I find it a little easier to watch than the, the Five Bloods and a little more accepting of what it's trying to do. But I think he too, you know, I agree with what Frank is saying about sort of the, the, the maybe the unconscious or more deliberately campaign to try and not remember the anti-war movement. We're even surprised that when Obama was talking about civil disobedience at the eulogy for John Lewis, he mentioned several constituencies and issues, civil rights and farmers and environmentalists and women and civil disobedience. And so he did not mention at all the anti-war movement. So it still seems to be dividing us. 
And um, Frank, what do you see? Well, it, just quickly, uh, a couple things. My friend Gerald Horn has uh, the great phrase malignant amnesia. And that's another way to say that, you know, the, the struggle for memory, Tom made this point himself many times, the struggle for memory, what's remembered, how it's remembered, etc., is a part of the political struggle of any given moment. And paradoxically, uh, even though I've made clear uh, my problems with, uh, with the Chicago conspiracy movie, all of these go to the fact that there is actually a hunger amongst people for deep social change. And that is, was true then, it's true now. And as much as the Pentagon or anybody else tries to obliterate uh, or uh, sort of coerce the forgetting of these stories and these struggles, uh, it ain't gonna work. Um, and I would say that speaking now as an elder, putting on my elder hat, mm -hmm. um, I've, some of you heard me say this before. Okay, so we were uh, the generation that said, uh, never trust anybody over 30. And maybe we didn't think that all the way through. Um, mm -hmm. But I raised that in the context of, it's very rewarding now, the quality of the dialogue that's going on between, in my life and many others, between older and younger activists. And I find that very encouraging uh, for the phase of the movement that we are uh, that we are in now. And Frank, thank you for those words. It makes me remember the the quote from a well-known Vietnamese writer who says, uh, "War wars are fought twice: the first time on the battlefield, yeah. and the second time in history, the second time in memory." And we're still dealing with that. Uh, we sure are. Obviously, let me just yeah, make we yeah, but thank you. Uh, let me just make the last uh, uh, commercial here, if you don't mind. Uh, and that's to invite you to um, join us next April 4th, when is the anniversary of King's speech, as well as his assassination. We have a project that we're calling uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Monuments. And what we're trying to encourage, and hopefully in every state, that people such as yourselves get together at a variety of places and simply read the speech, which tells us of the triple evils of militarism, racism, and he means poverty as well. He calls it sort of, uh, you know, uh, materialistic uh, consumerism. But these three issues are brought to life in the speech. And we would like to have them read at either Confederate monuments or uh, military bases that have racist names or even military bases could be a post office, it could be in your schools, congregations, synagogues, churches, mosques, libraries, post office, and you can even do them at home and maybe do them on YouTube. And on our website, we have this speech and we also will have it in Spanish. And there's also some video and some audio recordings. So we invite you to join us next April 4. It could be two people, it could be one person, it could be a hundred people, however many you would like to uh, get together and read the speech and join us in, an, in a nationwide action. And the last thing I'm going to say as we still continue the questions is please remember to donate and you can do that on our webpage, vietnampeace.org. All of you will hear about how you can see the YouTube video which will do the entire webinar. And you can also email me. Every one of you who registered has my email in case you need some more information or uh, has some questions. John, let's go back to you to see where we are in terms of audience and ask mm -hmm. another question here for you. Okay. Um, let's, a couple of people have said on the chat that they're not able to access individuals. I just checked and it's showing still that attendees can chat with all panelists and attendees. So again, go to the bottom of the chat column and you see it probably says there's a there's that little arrow pointing down and if you click on that you'll see i think you'll see all of the attendees names there um and you just go down to the attendee and click on the attendees name 
and you can send a message. Um, the other small housekeeping thing is when you go to, if you go to look at the, um, the video for this program, um, the webinar, you'll see it'll be on our channel. And that channel also includes the conference in 2015. And there's some wonderful uh, presentations and music, including uh, some eloquent remarks by Tom Hayden. Um, so, uh, you know, you could spend the next three weeks of COVID watching everything that's on that channel, but uh, at least dip through it and I think you'll find it interesting. Um, can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I have over a hundred people on my chat. Can I, can I answer those after we're finished here or do I have to do it right now? Um, we will have the whole chat and we'll make that available. I can't remember whether it has email addresses accessible to you, but um, okay. check with me afterwards. And But you can also respond to everybody if you cho choose all panelists and attendees. All right, then, th right. then that'll get a message out to everybody. And if you want to offer uh, an email address for them, you can do it that way too. Right. Um, so there were... Uh, if, if people look in the Q&A, they're going to find some interesting uh, comments about the impact of the trial. Um, our friend Richard Walden talked about being a law student in Penn and how the, the trial led to them going after police in, in Philadelphia. Um, there's also from Roger Hickey, an uh, interesting comment about the whole question, which has some bearing on our current time also, the political question about whether uh, the protests at the Chicago Convention or the way they were handled afterwards contributed to uh, Nixon's election and the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that goes too far afield, but I know, Frank, you and I have talked about that and others uh, on the panel may want to comment about that. I, I think maybe it's another webinar altogether. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, uh, there are a lot of questions uh, wrapped up into that. Um, I would just observe that one of the things I'm seeing in the current moment uh, is a very broad number of people, it's not everybody, but a very broad number of people who, <laughs> unfortunately in a way, but who are prepared to uh, vote against Trump and not sit it out uh, and not leave it to chance. And the other observation I would make is that I th my, I'm putting again my elder hat on here for a minute. Um, you should say what the elders are. We're oh, not just well, talking about your age. <laughs> well, that, that's enough, actually. But I, I belong to a group called the National Council of Elders. And you can, we're revising our website, but there is a National Council of well, El Elders up website that you can find and learn more about that. But the point I wanted to make is, this is, you know, this system is 500 years old. And it has gone from generation to generation to generation. And when it is challenged, it is, pardon the expression, adaptive. It is resilient. It pushes back. And so not understanding, as I admit, I did not, me of all people, did not sufficiently understand that the presidency of Barack Obama would contribute to the groundwork that was already there that would lead us to Donald Trump is it my own failure to under, understand this system and its history and how what it is willing to do to try to preserve itself. And I just say that to keep that in mind as we evaluate the past, demonstrations at the Democratic Convention in 68, good idea or bad idea, or the actions that we may be faced to take 
that we may need to take starting on November 4th. Mm. Equally, we, both periods were equally intense, that's for sure. Friends, I want to ask the question because we agreed with the panelists that we do this at least for two hours, and that's about two minutes from now. Uh, do we want to continue, or is this a good time to close at six o'clock? I, for one, do have to go and do think that this has been great, um, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> I, I think in the interest of time, if it's okay, I, I, I would propose that we wind it up and um, thank all of you for your contributions to the panelists and to the audience. We hope this was informative and there are ways to continue the discussion as you interact between us and follow what we do and stay in touch with us. So let me just thank you. Does anybody else have a, another thing to say before we finish? Terry, I'd like to just add one little thing, which is uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a website or a link, hope1111.com. If anybody's interested in the conversation that I was beginning to raise, which really is that our civilization is in trouble and that, that events are coming that are gonna transform the entire movement for change, no matter what you think. And that uh, if you're interested in that subject, uh, November 11th would be a good time to tune in. Great. <laughs> And Terry, I'd like to, to th again thank everyone who participated. I thought it was a, a truly outstanding panel. Uh, and I'm glad that we had disagreements because resolving those disagreements is the only way yeah. we're going to move forward. And then a little, a little commercial for myself. If you check out my website, www.yippygirl.com, anyone who's interested in finding out more about me or contacted me can do it through www.yippygirl.com. I'm sorry, but as you all know, that was a very yippy thing to do. <laughs> and so on behalf of all of us, I, I want to thank Rennie and Michelle and Tasha and Frank and Troy and Judy and Aislinn and Brewster and John. And we would really appreciate your support. We look forward to keeping in touch. And the last thing I want to say is hi to my 19-year-old son, Ian. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Take yeah. really good care. Yeah. Terry's saying goodbye, but I'm the only one that can end the, <laughs> the webinar. <laughs> Let me Bye. just say we had questions about the pictures which were introduced by Troy. Um, and I know that Judy also has a great collection of pictures. Um, I don't I don't know whether there's a, there is there must be some way we can uh, make them available. And if we can, we'll let you know, we will be able to get back to everybody. You'll get a, a note from us about the, uh, web page and other things. And this is something that we'll talk about among the VPCC folks. The webinar we did five days ago about nonviolence and civil disobedience, disobedience, led to breakout rooms that are now happening this weekend and next week. And they're actually, each of them is gonna be a, a, a Zoom call by itself. And Zoom calls have a much more participatory uh, feel to them that uh, folks can actually uh, speak to each other. And now this time we still have 360 people on. How we do that with such a big group is whether we offer a breakdown of topics or how we do it, I don't know, but we will try and, and see how the media, the modern media works in this situation. Um, finally, I wanted to thank Terry in particular and Frank for their roles in this um, and also we knew that we were getting second generation from Troy <laughs> and from the Dellinger daughters, <laughs> but Aislinn, you were a big surprise. I mean, your dad was also a very, very important person in the history of the anti-war movement, and, and it's a pleasure to have had you with us today. Um, I don't know, is he still with us, or do you want to say anything about 
him before we close off? He's very much still here and um, still organizing. Good. Good. Great. Well, that's wonderful. All right. Well, I will I would now... like. Yeah, go ahead. I would like to say one thing since we're sure. plugging ourselves. I've been working on a documentary about my film, my father and the evolution of the movement for a few years. And I have amassed uh, quite an archive of documents and photos. Wow. At the conclusion of this film, if it ever, this documentary, if it's ever finished, I'm going to um, put everything out online in a Tom Hayden archive for everybody to use, to repurpose or whatever. So if you have photos or dirty, salacious stories, you can email them. Thanks. <laughs> I sent you some, Troy. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you Bye. very, very much. Yeah. All right. So there is our web address if anybody wants it. David, um, I'm, we, I have a date with you. I am, I'm going to leave it open for a little bit because I want to make sure I've copied all the Q&A and, and have them and can make that available to people so you can uh, but the program is is over i'm just not going to actually close it until i have copied that